Good evening. I'm so glad that you are with me here tonight for yet another fantastic series of living in forgiveness. And, you know, when we look at forgiveness, it's just something that, that there's so much to talk about. And I happened to meet a pastor, had a conversation with him some time ago, and he's the author of a book. And it really spoke to me in, in terms of how we get busy, and maybe that's you tonight thinking, you know, I am so busy. It seems like there's always a holiday that is around the corner that we've got to prepare for. And so the things with the Lord tend to get back burnered. And tonight I want to just break you free of back burnering anything that isn't putting God first. And in, when I read this book, it's called World Gone Busy by Pastor Alan Bias, and, and I'm so blessed because he is here tonight with us, and, and you know, we're just going to get right into a few things and, and talk about how, how through forgiving ourselves, but also how through the recognition of being busy, we can be free. So thank you, Pastor, for being here. Thank you. You know, in, in reading this book, it, one of the things that really struck me was when I first opened the book, and the, it was like the very first line, and the very first line of you, that you write is, while you are capable of hearing and remembering your interactions with God, your high-speed, high-tech culture is usually preventing you from doing so. Yes. What led you to that revelation? Well, I was um, just a staff pastor at a church, and one of my responsibilities was um, counseling with people. Mm -hmm. And so someone would come into my office and, it, you know, God's not good. My life is terrible. It's never been good. It never will be. And I would just start talking with them. And part of what I would do is get them to recall for me, when was the last time you know you heard from God? When was the last time you know God interacted with you? When was the last positive thing you can remember? And they would start recalling these things, and you could just see their confidence and faith build. And then I would say, okay, great. Uh, you know, go get them. We'd pray. They'd be, thank you, Pastor Allen. They'd leave. And then two weeks later, they're back in the same condition. And that's when I started asking God, what is happening that we're hearing from you we're, we're, we're receiving some things for you, but it seems like we run off and forget. And, you know, isn't that, I find that so true where it's like those precious moments that we talk about wanting, but then we get them and then they're gone. And that's, maybe that's you today that you're saying, you know what, I crave more of the Lord, but I get too busy to have those moments. And, you know, that was me too. And, and in reading, reading Pastor Allen's book, it really just opened my eyes to the fact that I can have the Bible app on my phone. I can have this app. I can have that app, which is supposed to save me time. But think about how many apps you have on your phone. Are they saving you time? And, and you know, I, I was able to relate to that in seeing how those moments that I craved when they, when they came, I missed them. Yes. And you even, in your book here, you write, life is often made up of missed opportunities that keep us trapped in the same rut year after year. Yes, yes. How many years were you trapped in that rut, do you think? Oh, my. Um, I bet the f it's, it was about 10 or 15 years of pastoring and wondering what's happening. And it, even with forgiveness, how someone can walk in it one day and it seems like they forget and they can't the next before I finally started getting the concepts in this book of why busyness and distractions are making us not recognize our interactions with God and not remember them. And it's hurting us severely. And you know, I found that busy is bound under Satan's yoke. Yes. And I, I would rather be fruitful than busy. But, yes. You know, it seems like it's so hard to get to that. And so as I was reading through, I also found here where where you are rushing around everywhere robs us of our ability to truly be present here in the now. Yes. Yes. How do you then how do you recognize that you're not in the now? Okay, um I have a concept in the book called the big gray swirl. Uh-huh. 
Okay, I'm not saying the big gray squirrel. I did a talk one time, and at the end of the talk, somebody asked, me, what does that have to do with the squirrel? I was like, big gray swirl, okay? Right. Um, and I was at a, a meeting with my son at church, and the, they were the little kids, and they were going to do the watercolors. So I mm -hmm. thought, oh, this would be a perfect time for me to check my emails, text message my wife, you know, plan a grocery list. But God just said, just stop and be fully present in the here and now. So I, okay, fine. So I just sat and watched the kids do colors with their paints. And I saw one kid, he got a blue and then in a corner. He got red, same corner. He got gray, same corner. Anyway, he kept putting all the paint right on top of each other until it was one big gray swirl. And when he finished, he went, huh, and he threw it away. I saw another little boy, red in one corner, but then he used green in another corner, then blue in another corner, and he went down every color, but it had its separate space on the paper. And when he finished, it almost looked like a piece of stained glass window, and he said, Dad, can I keep this? And he said, sure. Can we hang it up? And he said, sure. And I felt like God said, with your life of busyness, you're doing what the first boy is doing with his watercolors. Everything on top of each other. It's a big gray swirl. You're going to get to the end of it and go, huh, what was that? Every activity in our life has a color. Right now, the only color that exists for me is talking to you right now. If I get on my phone and I do four of the things at the same time so I can be productive, I've lost this conversation. And, you know, it's an interesting thing when, when we look at that, where how often are we doing something on our way to doing something yet doing nothing. Yes. And, you know, this takes me to Second Corinthians. And so, I, you know, there's no way to not get in God's Word the, the entire Bible. I will talk about the Old and the New Testament. And so in Second Corinthians 7, listen to this. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Now, you may say, well, okay, what things do we need to clutter? Maybe it's not as big as what we may think. But here's the thing. Purify ourselves from everything, not some things, but everything that contaminates body and spirit. So let me ask this. Before a holiday comes, let's just say you celebrate Christmas, um, Thanksgiving, then you have Mother's Day, Father's Day, Fourth of July. How often are you stressed? How often are you trying to get all of the things in order to celebrate the traditions that your family is, has, has? And next thing you know, you're stressed. You have this anxiety. And then there might be a little bit of resentment because maybe your husband or wife isn't helping you in the way that you should or that they should. And then there's a little, little bit of maybe unforgiveness because you didn't do it the way that you think that you could or should have. And, and so when we look at that, what is contaminating you that you need to declutter? And it doesn't matter if you're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. You know, our age doesn't really matter what we've got going on in here that, that, that we need to really be taking a look at so that way we're not bound up in the things that really become meaningless. And one of the things I'm going to point out that he writes about in his book, and then I have more, of course I have more questions, but, but he writes here, I could either videotape my, child, my children's events or I could actually see them. And so when you look at this, and, and when we start removing what contaminates us, to what purifies us, we'll be better able to be living as who God created us to be. And so when we take a look at that, how much more of your life are you enjoying now that you're doing one thing at a time? Um, I'm convinced that a year feels more like two or three years when you do one thing at a time. That the way you have a New York minute is do five things at a time and it'll be one big blur. You know, I grew up in Elkhart, Indiana way up in northern Indiana in Amish country. We never said, I can't believe Christmas is here already. We said you're slower than Christmas. Because up in Elkhart, Indiana, near Amish country, if you were bowling, you just bowled. You did, if you were sitting in a cornfield eating a sandwich with your friend, you were just sitting in a cornfield. And down here in the metropolitan area and other places, when you get really, really busy, like with my son, I can either watch his play 
or I could video it. I couldn't do both. When I videoed it, I had to go home and watch the video to see what the play was like because it's so caught up in videoing it. So, I mean, I'm telling you, it feels like my life has slowed down. It's longer. I realize I have all the time I need to do whatever God calls me to do. And, you know, here in page 27, and, and folks, I can, I can really just go on with every single thing. I, when I look at this book, I have, I have so many places highlighted, underlined, and notes because I found that there were so many things that I, I was getting caught up in in my own life. But one of the poignant points that I think is so important that may be where, where you need to get free from today is this. So many times we think we're building a palace, but once we live in it for a while, we realize it's a prison. And you know what? That's what unforgiveness does to you. You may think, and this was me for so many years, that, that I thought that I forgave. Oh, oh, I forgave, I forgave, I said it, therefore it must have been done. Except when I started looking around, I was, I was <laughs> drinking the poison, really, and killing myself in, in the unforgiveness and building a palace that, that too, was nothing worth anything. It was just great little quicksand. And so what kind of palace are you building? What are you living in today? What really do you need to get free from? And it doesn't matter what it is. Maybe, maybe as you go into the next holiday, you're going to say, you know what? I have enough wrapping paper. I don't need to stress myself up about, about buying more things that, that are not going to be used after January. Maybe I don't need to stress myself out about even getting the, the gym membership that I know in my heart I'm not going to. Maybe it's just that I need to make my palace be the palace on high with him. And that will free you more than what you can recognize. You know, as I, as I went through the, this book, there were so many little tidbits but you, you have a, a headline here, Pursuing Who God Made Me to Be, You Being You. Yes. Now, at what point was, was it about the pursuit of, of that transformation? Well, it's, um, it, it, once you quiet yourself, once you slow down, once you start to get focused, then it really does free you up to hear from God. And only until you can really hear from God can you start to pursue who, you, who God has made you to be. I mean, I know people that they take tests for spiritual, you know, aptitudes and gifts and this, that, and another, but they're doing so in such a busy, cluster, cluttered, confused life that they're not going to really hear from what God says. They might get the results of a test. And so, like, one tip is just walking. Like, like what you just said was excellent in terms of what do you have to declutter? What can you do differently so that you can walk in greater freedom? Well, when you go on a walk, just go on a walk. No your phones. <laughs> no phone calls. I'm just going on a walk in the cool of the evening to give God an opportunity to tell me what those things are that I can declutter my life from. And mm -hmm. then that's when you start to really discover who God made you to be. So... Do you think that people don't recognize where they're at because of the other, they think that they're on the God path, but they're on the good path, trying and trying and trying. Yep. So do you think that, that in the world of busyness of trying, that in actuality as a society we're failing because we're, we're human doings and not human beings? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, I say a lot, good is the enemy of God. Because um, good is from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. And so many of us are just trying to be good Christians or, or do good at this or do good at that, as opposed to really focusing on what does God want for me in this opportunity, in, in this situation. And so, um, yeah, I mean, one of the things our family heard for Thanksgiving is we cut down the whole Thanksgiving meal to like a turkey and three sides. You know, it's interesting that you, that you bring that up because I listened to this lady on this radio program and she was just so frustrated and frustrated and, and maybe this is you where, you know, it's, okay, we got Christmas coming or Valentine's Day and, and Mother's Day and so you know you got to prepare all the food. But this in this interview, I don't know who the lady was. I don't even know what radio is. I don't know how. God just wanted me to hear this, this woman's testimony. She said, you know, we got rid of, I asked my children, what do you like most about each holiday? Yes. And so what do you like most about, 
about Thanksgiving, and they said, well, we like the dark meat, we like because we like the legs, and we like the stuffing, and we like the potatoes, and the pumpkin pie, and the cheesecake. And she said, for years, I was baking the the oyster dressing, which we had that growing up. It was terrible. <laughs> Awful. And we had the, the string bean casserole, and we had the cranberries, and the condom, da 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 And she said, nobody ate any of it. Yep. Which is kind of funny where we do, why are we doing the things that we're doing? It's for the sake of tradition. Yeah. But then, and she said, well, we got rid of that. It changed our Thanksgiving where we just had a wonderful meal with the family. And then we just spent the day together and she didn't have to do all those dishes. Sure. Well, I tell you, and here's the thing. This has been around forever. This has been a tactic of the enemy under Satan's joke, you know, busyness, bound under Satan's joke forever. I, I talk in a book about the Martha Mary story. Yes. Which is amazing. I mean, so in other words, culture and in the, the, the definition of the big gray swirl is, is part of it is a culture of busyness with distractions and so in that culture the women were supposed to know their place the men came in jesus came in so they were supposed to run around and start serving and and getting all the stuff mary perceiving that god was now in the room or at least jesus christ said i'm that's the, all that's going to exist for me i'm just going to sit and listen to jesus mary or mary sat down martha is running around and ends up getting frustrated goes to jesus like she doesn't know her place she needs to know her place. It's not sitting here and listening to you, but it's serving everybody and kind of listening, multitasking. Mm -hmm. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are busy and worried about many things. Some, some say anxious, others say nervous about many things, but Mary has chosen the better part. And for this reason, it will not be taken from her. Now, what if that take it from her doesn't mean I'm not gonna make her get up but she's going to actually remember what I'm saying. And, and you know what's so fascinating about that is I bet, I bet that the, the difference of experience between the, new women, the two women is profound. Yes. Because here Mary is with one focus and Martha is in another focus. And when we get so busy serving, what is our focus? It's on everything and not the one thing. Yes. And yes, and that's it. So the whole point is, in this case, ladies, we understand you have a really hard job and and you do have to multitask some in that the whole world can't stop because you're gonna you know feed the baby and you're kind of doing other stuff but i would love for us to learn how and then you can through the through the book when you perceive that god is saying something to you that you just say that's the only priority to me and i will listen and i will remember and it will not be taken from me regardless mm -hmm. of what culture says regardless of what pressures are on you to perform and do whatever you have to perform and do, say, no, God's talking to me right now. I'm sorry. That's all that matters. Amen. And, you know, in, in the book also you have the intensity of our awareness in a given experience affects our perception of time when recalling that experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's funny. I talk about um, have you ever, and guys are probably a lot more guilty of this, uh, it's Sunday, it's noon, you lay on the couch to watch the game, and you're just kind of vegging out. And before you know it, it's getting dark out. <laughs> Where'd the day go? Okay, you were not intensely involved in that activity. You were just kind of vegging. And so your whole day just goes by. But then there's other times where you are intently focused on something. Okay, so I don't know how long we've been talking right now, but this is the only thing that's existing.